Hey everybody, Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody's having an unbelievable uh, weekend. It's been busy for me. It's going to be busy definitely for the next couple of weeks, but throughout the remainder of the year, we've got a lot going on in a lot of different areas, but um, it's the way it is. You've heard me say at some point in time that I live my life on full so that when I leave this place, I die on the that's the way that I live. My grandmother told me when I was nine years old, let the life that you live speak for you. Live a life that has such an impact on others that they speak of you even after you're gone. And that's the life I'm trying to live. I'm not perfect, I haven't been perfect, but I'm constantly striving to be the best I can be each and every day. I challenge each of you to do the same thing. Uh, before I get started on this video, uh, and I'm not going to be long, I've been trying to keep my uh, videos 20 minutes under, you know that's a challenge for me, I can go an hour easy, um, but I've been doing pretty good, uh, and I guess the way to do it is to do it when I'm in the vehicle and also on my way somewhere and I've got to be there, but anyway, uh, don't forget, we are in the middle of a fundraiser this weekend. We goal is to raise $5,000. I can tell you now we're not anywhere close to it. We're not even anywhere close to a thousand. But I'm challenging you, if you believe in the work that I do, if you believe in the work that we've been doing at the Odyssey Project for more than two decades, if you believe in Black Man Lead, if you believe in Music is Life, if you believe in the research that we've done in the thousands upon thousands upon hours, the think tank that we've created to come up with solutions, Blueprint 2.0 and so much more. We need your support right now. I can't stress that enough. Let's talk. The, uh, and you can go right there in the description box, right at the top of the description box. There's a link and there's also our organization's cash app account uh, handle. So uh, show some love. Uh, let's 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 hit this goal. I want to know what it feels like to actually hit a goal in fundraising. Um, I'm that person that always just figures out a way to make it happen. And my people are like, you can't keep doing that. My family's like, you can't get keep doing that. Um, and you know, obviously they are making valid points, but um, I can see how some of the elders and the ancestors get caught up in this thing and let their love for our people destroy the future of their gener the future that they're supposed to be building for their generations. I won't allow that to happen, but I am going to do everything I can to keep my work going. Uh, with that being said, look, there's a lot popping off, and you know me, I'm always looking for the teaching moment, not so much uh, the sens sensationalism that's going around with all these trends and trendy topics and trendy stories, but what are we getting out of it? Because we tend to miss the deeper issues. We tend to get caught up in the superficial uh, narratives and we lose sight of something bigger. Uh, in the NFL, and we've been having this discussion about the NFL for at least about eight or nine years, literally, and we still don't get it. And I don't know if we're going to get it anytime soon, but there's more than just a lesson to be learned about the NFL. This is a lesson where the NFL is a microcosm of a bigger issue. Uh, quarterback Tua, uh, Tua, Tua Galova, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, I mispronounced that last name, but Tua, uh, Tua Galova, uh, Logan, um, had an incident on Sunday where he got hit was definitely groggy and got up, took a few steps and stumbled again and almost fell, caught his balance, went through what they say was concussion protocol, got cleared to go back in the game. That set off the ire of the players, the NFL Players Association that immediately called for a revamping of the concussion protocol. Well, Tua uh, ended up playing again four days later on Thursday night football and was slammed to the ground and had to leave on a stretcher. 
head and neck injuries. Definitely uh, seemed to be okay after being checked out. He was released from the hospital and sent home, but obviously probably won't be playing. Well, he, the good thing is he doesn't have to play Sunday anyway, but may not be playing the following week depending on what happens because it was a pretty scary thing if you saw it. And everybody's talking about uh, not protecting the players. Not, and what we don't get is the same thing we don't get in the workforce that when we are showing up with our talents and we are blessing them with our talents when we're showing up and they are giving us what we believe to be significant salaries all things considered and obviously it's happening on a different level when you talk about the nfl and other other sports because it's a bigger market and it's a lot of money flowing so there's a lot of money flowing through the hands of these players but there is no amount of money that can account for quality of life. You're talking about a situation where there are at least two players that I could think of right off the top of their head that kill themselves because they couldn't deal with uh, everything that was happening with the CTE, which is a neurological uh, condition that is directly associated with being concussed. Uh, you know, the human brain wasn't made to be bounced around inside the skull the way it does in high impact sports. And um, we found by a, an African doctor that this was happening in NFL players on a regular basis. Junior Seah killed himself, shot himself in the chest, uh, which is abnormal for someone who's committing suicide with a gun, but he wanted his brain to be studied and he had CTE, C, um, uh, Aaron Gonzalez, uh, while in prison, killed himself. He had the worst case of CTE for anyone in his age bracket ever recorded. He was 28 years old, I believe. And 28 years old, he was already just gone, just brain just fried. And, uh, and, and there's so many other things going on. So, so you've got that, right? And so everybody's talking about, you know, not protecting the players. Let me tell you something. You got a league where 75% of the talent is black. Almost 100% of the ownership is white and about 80% of the fans are white. Fans been telling you to shut up and play ball, shut up and dribble all these other things because they really don't want you to have an opinion. They don't want you to use a platform given to you by your celebrity. They want you to entertain them. That's what you're there for. You are high paid entertainment. That's it. They don't want anything else out of you. But what we still haven't understood, we can, now if you want to understand what I'm talking about, I say it's a microcosm. Let's visit real quickly uh, the beauty supply industry. The beauty supply industry is a $15 billion a year industry, not small by any stretch of the imagination. The last I checked, 96% of that revenue, 96% of that 15 billion, which is 14.4 billion, is generated from black dollars. Now, black ownership is like less than 5%. It's because we don't understand the value of owning. We don't understand the value of taking our talents and doing something different with them. We're afraid to lose what we do have in an attempt to build something else. I see this with clients. They're coming and they say they want a new business. They say they want to start a business. They say they're tired of working. Here's the truth. Regardless of race, 85% of the people in this country wake up every day and go into a job that they hate. 85% of the people in this country are unhappy with their job. I can imagine that that's probably even higher with blacks because we deal with a lot more in the workforce than the average person. So you gotta you gotta imagine that that, that we live in a world where very few are benefiting from the dis I mean from the exploitation, the misuse, the mishandling. Uh, I mean, you got to think about all the things that go on. You know, they are starting to have to do better because there's an awareness now that's starting to take place where people are starting to understand I'm worth more than what you're paying me. I, my life and my health and my longevity and, and my quality of life is better. You're stressing me out. People are dying early because they work stress, stressful jobs. Uh, we know that, that the empirical data is there. So 
But with us, we walk into the workplace and we're just happy to be there. And because we're just happy to be there, we give them everything that they need from us to stay there. And we don't count the cost. Now, I don't doubt for a second that when Tua, Tua Velova, however you pronounce his name, Tua, uh, whatever, Tua is his first name. I'm not even trying to pronounce the last name. I'm pretty sure when he had that uh, that concussion on Sunday and he went back in the game, I'm pretty sure he convinced them. He did everything he could to convince them he wasn't concussed. Uh, com competitors want to compete. But see, that's what the protocols are supposed to be for. But we have to also be aware of the value of who we are, not just to ourselves, but to our families. And, and we need to protect that value at all costs. My problem is that we have far too many people. I mean, do you realize 75% of the talent, and I mean the talented positions, even the most coveted position that they held to themselves as long as they possibly could, is being transitioned into a, a, a position that black quarterbacks are starting to dominate, and that's the quarterback position. The last of the old heads are going out and you're starting to see these young, talented, highly mobile black quarterbacks start to take the front and center. And they're getting these big contracts because they can do things that that uh, non-mobile quarterback that they call cerebral. They found out that blacks can be athletic, have a strong arm and cerebral. And now we're, we're taking that. But here's the problem. If all we're going to do is demand high contract, I'm not saying don't get your money. I'm not saying don't get your money, but I'm saying, do you understand the value? One of the things that I had to do in my life is I had to count the cost. I had to sit up and I had to understand just how valuable I was. And I had to understand that nobody was going to pay me what I was worth working for someone else. And I had to be willing to go out there and create something for myself. And there's a risk that comes along with that. That is a risk that comes along with saying, you know what? I'm going to build something for me because it's you. There's nobody to blame on. You don't show up and punch a clock. And I'm. this isn't a, a diatribe about owning your own business. This is a diatribe about understanding your worth. This is a diatribe about blacks understanding their value in the market because it's not even about necessarily owning business. But my thing is, if you are controlling 96% of the revenue that's going into a particular industry, the beauty supply industry, we are we, we uh, are eating seafood at a rate of nine, nine blacks to every one white. We dominate seafood uh, consumption. Have very little ownership in that area. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is if there's a $15 billion a year industry and I am investing $14.4 billion in that, then I understand I have the power not to go out and start a bit. I might not want to own a beauty supply store, but I'm, I've got to understand that if I get enough people together that are doing the same thing I'm doing and spending money in beauty supply, we can invest in somebody who do, does want it. We can also invest in vertical economics. That's one of the places that we struggle in because the few blacks that try to get into beauty, especially beauty supply, uh, they, get, they, they, they find out that uh, they don't have longevity. Let me explain to you real briefly why they don't have longevity. Then I'm going to go ahead and jump off of here because I've been where I'm supposed to be at. But check this out. That's this thing called vertical economics. Uh, Dr. Claude Anderson preached it until he was blue in the face. Nobody listened to him. And it's, it's sad because there was a lot to learn. Everybody's so busy trying to be right that nobody's willing to understand what's going on. That's this thing called vertical economics. I don't care who teaches it. I don't care who says it. It's vertical economics. If you watch every other enclave, they practice vertical economics. Vertical economics means that I'm not just going into an industry that own the entry level uh, businesses because I understand that's not... Uh, where I can sustain viability without connectivity. And so what is vertical economics? Vertical economics means that I can't just own the retail shop. I have to own distribution. I have to own manufacturing. So I need to be able to create the product. I need to be able to distribute the product and I need to be able to have a place to sell the product. Why do I need to have a place? To, why do I need to be able to manufacture? Because manufacturing is going to determine the cost. Distribu distribution is going to determine the cost. Here's why black businesses 
people who have blacks who have tried to get into beauty supply have struggled because they get in distribution and manufacturing and product acquisition is controlled by Asians so guess what happens you open up your store in your hood there's an Asian store across the street the Asian uh, store owner is getting the same products you're getting but they're getting them at a 75% discount in comparison to what you're giving they're literally pricing you out of your community because your community has not been programmed to buy from you regardless so they are going to the cheapest place it doesn't have any benefit any, nothing to do with whether they like you or not it's just simply how we're programmed we're going to go where the lowest thicker price is they understand that and they control that and until we do uh, one or two things or both until we start uh, investing in distribution and manufacturing to where we can control the price so we can give the same breaks to our people that they're giving to theirs while charging them higher to get it um, then we're going to have to uh, have a situation where we have to work on uh, programming blacks to buy from blacks in situations understand it and that's the problem is blacks don't understand that blacks don't know why is this product so much higher you they think you just overcharge them they don't understand that acquisition of the product was a higher cost for you and so th they look at it like well, I'm gonna go over here and spend it and that's a problem we have but when so when I look at what's going on with tour that's just the high-end uh, sensationalized reality that most blacks are dealing with we don't understand our value so we don't demand what we should and we don't take our value and create new opportunities for ourselves that's a problem I you know I'm, I'm, I'm constantly talking about owning your own why and I and I've said this and um, you've seen me offer uh, opportunities to have me teach you or my program that I created to teach you how to start an online business from scratch with little or nothing and take it from there. You've also heard me say that I'll have my company build that same type of business for you and monitor it. What I'm trying to get you to understand is even if you have a great job, you need to hedge that. You should always have multiple streams of income. You want as many passive streams of income as you possibly can. Number one, and passive streams of income don't require you to work in order for them to produce revenue for you. You need those things. So what I'm getting at here, and then I'm done, is we've got to do a better job of thinking beyond the surface. We've got to do a better job of being more than people who are looking to be entertained. We've got to be willing to do more than just desire to be accepted. We are going to have to establish a foundation on which we can stand and execute and exhibit power. If we don't do that, we're going to constantly find ourselves being mishandled, misused, exploited, and we're going to have poor qualities of life because we're having such a hard time just getting that paper that we say we're getting. And, and that goes up to this 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 guy who's well paid. He, 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 he's getting paid. But what good is it going to be if he can't enjoy it? Because by the time he's 40, he can't remember anything. We got to be able to count the cost and we got to make sure that we're putting up. I mean, it's so much more to this than what we get to see. We see the surface and we talk about it and it's a big conversation right now. How horrible the NFL is for doing this. The NFL looks at its players as a product, not people, a product. It's a commodity. You as a player are a commodity. And the difference is between, when you talk about athletics as a business, the difference between the product that you put on the floor and the product you find on the shelf is that this product can think for itself. This product has the capacity to understand its value. You've seen it in baseball, you see, you see it in basketball starting to evolve and it's getting to a point where you're starting to see how players can execute their power and move and sit up. If I'm the face of the league, if I'm that type of person, I carry some significant weight. I can move some people, I can get some people involved before you know it, but the thing is, we're not even thinking on that level. We're just happy, we're just happy to say I'm the highest paid player.
or I'm the tenth highest paid player, or you know, and then you know. Imagine this: if blacks make up seventy-two to seventy-five percent of the talent in the NFL. I don't mean just talent of position. I mean, we make up 75% of the player population. What do you think the percentage of blacks versus whites and, 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 uh, and, and other races is going to be from long-term head trauma, head injuries, and suffering and quality of life later in life? Who, who, who's gonna, what race is going to be most negatively impacted by this situation? Exactly. We've got to do better. We've got to see the big picture. Nobody ever looks at it. Nobody ever says, okay, what's underneath the surface? Okay, I see what's happening here. That's some messed up stuff, but what's underneath it? I'm always looking underneath. I'm always lifting it up and saying, what's going on? Why is it happening? What can it, what could be done about it? What's different? Is it just something that impacts that person? Or do, can we look at it and find a way that it's connected and it impacts all of us? Is there is that is there that type of connectivity? Look. I'm going to continue to do what I'm doing. We're going to continue uh, to do what we do as a think tank. We're going to continue to do uh, do what we do as a service provider. We're going to continue to do what we do uh, in the way of sharing information and distributing information by podcast, uh, by these live sessions, by uh, whatever way that I can get it out there. I'm still writing, um, and I've got a couple more books coming out next year. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm I'm going to always be doing what I do, but we've got to be aware. We've got to do more. You've heard me say this. I don't know how many times that we lose constantly because we don't understand how things work. We never take time to gain an understanding of how we're being impacted and why we're being impacted and why we're being easily triggered about stuff uh, that misdirects us. All of these things are strategic. They're not happenstance. They're strategic. These are schemes and machinations that they come up with. And the goal is to constantly keep us at the bottom rung of the socioeconomic ladder. Our job is to climb. And we're not going to do it by how many jobs we get, no matter how well they pay. That's that. So again, as I get ready to get off, I want to remind you, we are having a fundraiser. If you believe in the work we do, if you believe that there's some value to what I do, I'm personally asking you to support the work we do because it doesn't come free. And if you believe in what we do, and if you have some things that you think you want us to get involved in and be involved, we, we are constantly, we are, we are here. As long as I'm breathing, the Odyssey Project is here. And I'm looking for some people who are ready to take it after I'm done. Uh, because I think it's so necessary. And on that note, look, I'm going to get out of here. Again, the link to show your love and support is in the description box. Um, you can also give via Cash App. That information is also in the description box. But whatever you do, think about this. Share it with some friends. Sit down and talk about it. Start to determine that you're going to find a way to look beneath the surface more consistently and see what you come up with. On that note, look, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable day.